Hi everyone. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, I know that the participant room is still filling, uh, but we will go ahead and get moving because we want to make sure we're mindful of all of your time today. Greetings from Baltimore, Maryland, the home of the Peabody Institute at the Johns Hopkins University. My name is Abra Bush and I'm the Senior Associate Dean of Institute Studies here at Peabody. I'm absolutely delighted you could join us today for chamber music and instrumental ensembles in a remote learning environment. The ninth in our series of 10 summer lunch and learn events focused on, the focused on the challenges and opportunities of remote instruction for music. A special thanks goes to the academic leadership at many of the conservatories and schools of music in the United States and the United Kingdom for their support for this series. They have been gracious in recommending presenters who do excellent work in the area of remote and online pedagogy. Before we get started, I'd like to thank four Peabody staff members who are joining us today and supporting this event. Adam Scalici from Peabody's production team will be in the background monitoring the webinar and working through any technical challenges we may encounter. Should you have technical issues, please put them in the chat and those comments will go directly to Adam. Patrick Wallen from the Dean's Office, Christina Mancior and Zane Forshee from Peabody's Launchpad will provide additional support and help me curate your questions. A very special thank you to all of them. A few quick notes before we begin. I see that many of you are already hopping into the chat to introduce yourselves. Please be sure that you set the to button to all panelists and attendees so that everyone, not just the panelists, can see who is here. We hope that you'll consider this an interactive session. The presenters will spend a few moments each talking about some of the challenges and opportunities of remote instruction, and then we will reserve the remainder of the time for questions from you. Please plan to place your questions in the Q&A area of the webinar. That will help us make sure that we can find them and uh, group them together so that we can appropriately address them, as many of them as we can. Note that the presenters have agreed to permit us to record this webinar and the session will be posted to the Peabody Keep Teaching website within one to two business days should you wish to refer to it again or share it. And now without further ado, I could not be more pleased to welcome our guest presenters for today. Marin Alsop is the Peabody Institute Professor and Director of the Graduate Conducting Program, Music Director of the Baltimore Symphony, and Artistic Director of the Vienna Radio Symphony Orchestra. Claire Chase is a soloist, collaborative artist, co-founder of International Contemporary Ensemble ICE, and a fellow OB. Jerry Junkin, <laughs> is from the UT Austin Butler School of Music. He is the professor of wind conducting and director of bands. And Michael Cannon is the Peabody Institute professor and director of chamber music. Their full biographies may be found on the Peabody Keep Teaching website. So as a place to start, Michael, thank you so much for being with us today. I would love to hear more about how you are approaching the challenges that COVID has brought into the area of chamber music in this remote environment. Well, thank you for um, inviting me to be here today, Abra. And um, when in March things kind of um, kind of blew up and we were all sent home, um, you know, we, we realized very quickly that we were gonna have to start thinking about what it is that, that we're gonna do going forward uh, when the scope of this thing started to um, become apparent. And, um, you know, if you, if you can sort of put aside the, the horror for the, uh, you know, that's the reason we're having to do this, it's actually been quite stimulating, I think, uh, quite interesting, a problem to, um, to address. And, and the one thing that I think should be said right off the, the bat, to, to, the, to a certain extent, um, we can't really play chamber music online. I mean, there, there's all kinds of technology being worked out now and, and people are working hard. And of course, it's unleashed all kinds of um, creativity. But right now, um, with what we have. I mean, we, we sort of have the, the, um, the technology, but we haven't come up with an answer to the laws of physics yet <laughs> that allows us to have four string players, say, in four different places and play a string quartet together. So, you know, we have to start with that unfortunate limitation. But what, what we did, um, and when I say we, I'm talking about me and, and the phenomenal chamber music faculty that we have at Peabody, you know, we really, it really caused us to look at um, 
really what our values were and what what exactly are we trying to uh, to teach and we took a look at our um, mission statement our departmental mission statement we took a look at um, our syllabus and other things and and we um, you know we really we decided that that rather that that it made no sense to try to replicate what we do in normal times but that there are real opportunities for expanding what we do in normal times teaching chamber music learning chamber music it's such a complex process there are so many layers of it and so much of um of what we're trying to teach them is what to do before they actually sit down to play with one another and these are issues that very often um, get short shrift when we're together and we're trying to sound good. Um, and so this is a real opportunity to look at some of those things, score study, part preparation, how to come to um, an interpretation of a piece, how to get all the little dots and dashes and lines off the page into real sound, how to decide what a piece is about. And, and then go about um, uh, to, uh, deciding what's the, the, the most effective way to express that. So these are all things that can be done through discussion. We found that listening with the students, listening to recordings, presenting to them recordings that we feel represent the highest ideals of ensemble playing and, and interpretation, um, and especially historic recordings that, that students are not generally, um, generally familiar with, you know, the playing of uh, Arthur Schnabel and, and Sigetti, for instance. Um, you know, that's a, a favorite recording of mine to play for students. So, so we wanted to hew as closely as we could to the letter and the spirit of our syllabus. Um, we wanted to work very hard not to turn it into an academic class because that's not what chamber music is normally. Now, I, I have to say, I've been speaking with my colleagues all over the country. It's actually been a wonderful opportunity to be in touch with them and to, to, to see what they're doing. And there are all kinds of different approaches and people are doing so many creative things. And there are various levels of playing planned. Um, uh, but I think everyone has come to more or less the same conclusions about what it is we can do in this situation. Michael, thanks. Jerry, what happened when you left in March and, and how have things unfolded for you both at UT Austin and in your professional conducting life? Well, first, uh, thanks, Abra, for the invitation to be with everyone. And uh, the, yeah, I, the last concert I conducted was on March the 6th here in Austin. And just it was weird timing. But the next day I leave for New York for a function. And uh, that was the week that all hell broke loose. Um, and I actually had my own experience with COVID-19 as a result of that, but every, everything worked out fine. But that meant that all of the, the upcoming engagements, my stack of scores is still in the same place. So two concerts in Dallas, another one in Austin, one in Hong Kong, one, you know, just the list goes on of things that just came to a screeching halt. So with our own students, uh, and this is this is the issue is that now looking ahead to the fall, what do we do in all of these different environments because they are so different in a way uh, here this is kind of breaking news. I was just telling my colleagues that we just made the decision on Friday that going forward uh, in the fall, we will not have any kind of ensembles at UT and that's based on the science of the situation right now. And the fact that here in Texas, we're in our first wave. I mean, it hit us much later, but it's it's raging right now. So things are not good. Um, and uh, this is based on air handling and, you know, the, the aerosol dispersants, all of, all of the science that goes into this. We just can't feel like we can deliver a quality program in a safe way. So we have shifted so that we're going to be online and we're going to have a group of community seminars. Uh, so the woodwind, brass and percussion will be in Zoom, large Zoom meetings that 
uh, I will do, and then Farhad Hudia, my orchestra conducting colleague, will do one for strings, et cetera, et cetera, throughout the school. And we'll deal, as Michael was talking about, uh, with matters that can be worthwhile for students relating to their ensemble experience, how to prepare for an audition, how to win an audition, life and how to keep the job once you've got the job. Uh, once, you know, life as a military band musician, life as a public school, a secondary music educator. Um, how to read a score because we're, you know, we're saying to instrumentalists, well, you should always avail yourself of the score. You should always see how you fit in. But yet a lot of people don't have any real knowledge about how to read a score. Uh, and what that actually means. So all of these sort of topics are things that we can actually maybe do uh, in maybe even a more effective way than we would do it during normal business hours. Uh, in Hong Kong, the COVID-19 situation is improved greatly there, but they have other issues as we all know in Hong Kong, which means that we probably won't be back together again until the spring. Uh, in Dallas, there are Every community is dealing with this. So there are city regulations. Marin knows the hall in Dallas very well. And it's, uh, they have determined that probably 199 people is all that can fit safely uh, with social distancing. Uh, so that means that there's really impractical to give a concert there. So anyway, there's, a, there's just a lot of things going on and we're trying to make the very best for our students and for the people that, you know, for our audiences that somehow find a way to keep the music going, but also try to make it a valuable experience. So that's kind of where we are right at the moment. Thank you, Jerry, you alluded to a lot of the issues surrounding science. We did host a webinar two weeks ago on that topic and I'll ask my team to put that into the chat for any of you that maybe haven't seen it, but we were able to pull together a group of Hopkins epidemiologists, infection control and environmental health and safety folks in order to address some of those challenges. So I would refer any of you um, who are watching today to that webinar uh, for more details on, on those specific issues. Claire, I know you've been very busy in, uh, since March, uh, not in the ways you ever anticipated. Uh, do you wanna maybe fill us in a little bit about what's going on with you and how you're still making music during this time? Sure thing. Well, first of all, let me just say what a pleasure it is to be here with all of you in this, in this proverbial room. Um, you know, as a musician whose work is, is deeply collaborative by nature, this has been, I mean, not surprisingly, it's been, it's been a profoundly lonely and also confronting time. And it has been for almost every musician that I know. Um, and I've actually taken a lot of comfort in, um, in being able to say that and also share that with students. Um, I mean, of course, our, our adaptability and our, quite literally, our ability to respond, our responsibility as artists and as educators um, is to make with whatever we have. And so I've been deeply invested in that too. But I think it's important to acknowledge how difficult this moment is and also how, how very much we can locate it in other moments of history. I mean, we can't locate this precise pandemic, but um, I've been spending a lot of time with the work of James Baldwin over the last couple of months and um, you know, something that he said almost half a century ago that maybe the, the primary distinction of the artist is that he must actively cultivate that state, which most people avoid necessarily, which is the state of being alone. And so my question as an artist has been, okay, so how can I actually lean into this loneliness and to this sense of isolation um, and do everything that I can to be of support to other people who are lonely? And that includes finding every possible way to make music with them over these compromised mediums. So that's taken various forms for me. I mean, in the most um, kind, of, kind of straightforward way, I've played, I don't know, I've, I've maybe 60 different benefit concerts in the last four months. Um, and most of them have been, you know, solo recitals that I do here in my living room with a little electronic rig. Um, I've also done a lot of improvisation. You know, Zoom, as we know, is a, is a really, really challenging medium for cancellation of voices. So all of your musical instincts, if you're improvising with a person of matching timbre or register, or even matching, you know, the energy level of a performer, the Zoom algorithm will cancel out one of those voices. So while we can't do anything about that technological glitch at the moment, what we can do is look at that as a new kind of instrument to learn how to play and a new way of being sensitive and a new way of musically attuning to latency, to a little bit more time than we have ever felt as comfortable to respond in kind to a musical gesture. 
And so in the same way that I feel like I've been leaning into the loneliness, I'm also trying to lean into all of the quote unquote limitations of, of this moment and of the technologies that are available to us. Um, on, you know, slightly, on a slightly more creative scale, I, um, I, mean, I mean, as an artist, I don't have a choice, I have to play. I'll go completely star craving mad if I don't play the flute. And if I don't play it in some way for people. Um, and so I started working with an experimental ballet company here in Brooklyn. And we started meeting in the park at, at you know, large socially distanced, 25 feet. Of course, for all the reasons that have been pointed out, um, you know, wind instruments and singers have a, we have a special challenge and we really don't know how far our particles travel. So I rigged up a little translucent umbrella for myself and parked myself on a, on a, on a hill in the park very far away from people to make sure that, you know, <laughs> the flute particles weren't going farther than this little umbrella and set up a little sound rig for myself there. So I've been doing things like that. You know, on a more collaborative front, um, one of the first things I did during the lockdown was organize a, a worldwide tuning meditation. So for those of you who might be familiar with the work of Paulina Oliveros, um, she wrote a gorgeous piece in 1971 for any number of voices. And the piece actually works beautifully over, over Zoom. We had about a thousand people singing together, um, musicians, non-musicians, children, adults. Um, we had some you know, musical luminaries who showed up and a lot of people who'd never done anything like this before and never considered themselves musicians. We had animals show up on, on the Zoom screen. Um, and, and it was really, really wonderful to have a thousand people every Saturday meet in, you know, between 30 and 40 different countries, meet on Zoom for an hour and, and sing together. So I've been involved in organizing efforts like that. And I've also just been trying to support as many composers and, and artists specifically in our field who don't have academic positions, who don't have salaries, for whom this is a m massive and, and, and really just unthinkable crisis financially and creatively. Um, so I've been commissioning a lot of work from independent artists um, and I, one of the very first things I did um, in, in the lockdown was, was get together with a group of artists and form an initiative called the New Music Solidarity Fund. And basically it was, it was one of many, um, I mean there, there are hundreds, thousands of artist driven initiatives that were direct to artist funding. So not through a foundation, not through an application process that was laborious, but ways of getting cold hard cash to the artists who needed that needed that resource as soon as possible. Um, and we raised about a half million dollars in, in the first month and were able to give out a thousand five hundred dollar grants. What was really interesting to me about that process was being a part of a community um, of direct to artist, artist driven um, organized relief efforts that I had no idea how massive it was until I looked at, I'll put this in the chat. Um, there was a a, a Google document that aggregated, um, let me just see if I can put this here, aggregated um, all of these efforts and, a, and about $14 million was raised nationally by artists advocating for and organizing for other artists. And it's, an, it's a staggering number. And on this list, you'll see very small outfits, you know, that, that had a goal of raising $1,000 and giving it away to a group of artists in, in a specific community. And then there are large um, efforts like Artistry Relief and Seattle Relief Fund and, and some of the other larger names. Um, but it was really, I, I felt really grateful to be a part of that. Um, and, and, you know, these things have also really informed my thinking um, around what my responsibility as an, as an educator. You know, what are we professors of right now? Really? Um, what, are, what are we teaching? <laughs> and so I've completely rethought all of my curriculum for the fall. Um, and I am I'm working with professors at Harvard in five different departments to design um, in an interdisciplinary course to make work in, in, a, in a transdisciplinary context, but also to importantly talk about the world in a context that is, um, that is outside of music, that is embracing politics, history, visual art, and, um, and, and the state of our world, and to invite students into the process of making work alongside us, admitting that there's just so much that we don't know right now. Thanks, Clara. Marin, you wear three important hats, uh, director of graduate conducting for us, uh, music director of the Baltimore Symphony, and artistic director of the Vienna Radio Symphony Orchestra. How has this COVID time played out in your world? And uh, where do you see opportunities and challenges? Marin, you're muted, I'm sorry. There you go. Famous line, huh? <laughs> Famous. Um, you're muted. Uh, it's great to be here and um, very, very inspired by what you were just saying, Claire, and um, also um, uh, the comments from Michael and Jerry. Um, uh, very appreciated. The 
I think that, um, you know, these, these moments, these defining moments are, are really moments of opportunity. We have to look at them as moments of opportunity. Otherwise we'll go crazy also. But I think, um, I think it took me a little while to accept that what we do is not possible. I mean, what we were doing is not possible. And instead of trying to simulate what we were doing in, in sort of a shadow of what it was, once was, instead, um, if we could start to think about how to transform and evolve and, and deal with many of the issues that I think um, have afflicted our industry for many, many years, but we haven't had the time or the bandwidth to deal with. Um, I think this is the moment where we can gather forces and, and, and link arms to try to not only put arts on the front burner, but make them a driving force throughout our educational system in the United States. What I see between US and Europe is not even comparable. Europe you know, is investing billions in the arts, understanding that they need it. Here, you know, efforts like what Claire started with several of the publishing companies, and it was, it's fantastic, the Solidarity Fund, but these all have to be generated by individuals. Let's start to get art um, really at the forefront of our educational commitment. Young people need this as an outlet, especially now to feel their imagination, to be in touch with who they are. Um, so it took me a while to um, let go of trying to make, trying to make it be what it was. <laughs> you know, instead now I'm trying to embrace what it could be and understanding that I don't have the answers, but I think collectively we can find a path forward. And um, I, I've already written down three pages of notes from what everyone said this morning. This is something that I never anticipated that um, the fact that we have access to each other in a way that we never had before. This has been an incredible gift, I have to say. And to all the, all the many, many people joining us from not just around the US, but around the world, you know, it is great to feel your energy here as much as, the, as that's possible and to get ideas from each other and to try to play off of each other. And I would say, I speak for all of us in saying, we want to be a resource to everyone. We want to be helpful. Um, you know, and then let's start to think, let's stop trying to make the same thing again. We can't right now. Let's try to make something brand new. And that's the way I'm thinking, Abra. You know, whether it's, you know, I'm, I'm working with Thomas Dolby, we're working on a, a, a VR, um, experience for conducting students to practice conducting. You know, if we can figure our way through this, this will be a great tool for the future to add to, to our toolbox. Um, I think this idea, Claire, that you were just speaking about, um, about interdisciplinary education, you know, here I am at Hopkins, and somehow that hadn't really occurred to me yet. So I'm going back and redoing and c contacting everyone. This is a great thought. Because to be an artist in the world, especially today, one needs context. One needs to understand what is influencing us, what we can influence. And perhaps now we can really get to the idea of the artist as a, a world citizen. How can we really work on that? Because in essence, that's really the most important goal but it's one that we can never really focus on because we're busy, you know, with our other um, achievements. So anyway, um, those are just my thoughts and, and really mostly inspired by your panelists. Great. Thank you so much. Michael? Yeah, I would just like to um, respond uh, to, to everyone, actually. I, I mean, I think we're all finding out that, that, that um, even, even the Zoom platform is opening up um, uh, the, these channels of communication, and I, yeah, Claire, I, I love this idea that now Marin is inspired by the, the interdisciplinary um, uh, idea. And actually, I found that that it with my students, it's happening kind of spontaneously. 
I've, I've continued um, to, to speak with my students online um, and um, meeting uh, many of them one-on-one. -on -one, uh, and it's been extremely rewarding for me, I have to say, in a way that I never had an opportunity to do before. But, but what we're talking about is what books they're reading and what movies they're watching and what creative things. And I've found students who, who are, you know, are making phenomenally beautiful paintings. And, and, you know, and a violin student who's gotten really interested in acting and was reading the, the Stanislavski book and, and, uh, and watching um, um, uh, 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 A Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. You know, this is a, a young violinist from China. And, um, and inevitably, these discussions circle back to music and, and how what they're learning in these other art forms are the same as what we're trying to do when we're playing when we're playing chamber music. And so, um, yeah, this is something that I hope will will carry on forever, even after we out of the, we're out of this nightmare. But um, that, that has been a, a true opportunity in all of this. So one of the questions that came up was specifically addressed to Michael, but I'll open it up to any of you. Um, very early on in the pandemic, we saw many examples of sort of layering approaches to ensembles, whether they be instrumental ensembles or choirs, and everyone was sort of in those Brady box bunches or a Brady Brady bunch boxes. Say, try <laughs> saying that really fast a lot of times. <laughs> um, are any of you planning on utilizing any of those kinds of techniques or that those that software into the fall? And if if so, why? And if not, why not? Sure, I can I can just briefly address that. And I've I've had this conversation with um, you know people who are running chamber music programs all over the country. Um, and yeah, you know there is definitely a utility in that. There is no doubt about it that there's a kind of deep listening. That, um, that you do uh, in order to have to layer um, a recording like that together. Um, th there are things to be learned from everything we do. There's no doubt about it. And there is the satisfaction of having something at the end, um, the product. The reason um, not to do it uh, too much for me is that um, for me, uh, it's, it, it's a little bit teaching a value that's the opposite of what I'm trying to teach my students in chamber music, which is to do that layering um, thing. You have to listen to something and learn to do it the same every single time, to like learn what a person has done exactly in every detail, which is a valuable exercise of the listening muscle. But in the end, um, it's the opposite of what I'm teaching them in their coachings, which is be in the moment, respond, react, make sure it's different every time, you know. So I think if one does it, and I, th I think absolutely there is utility in it, and many people are, are finding that, um, but make sure that the students understand that, that um, what values to bring forward when they're in, in person and which ones not to bring forward. If I, if I may, I, I would just add to that. Thank you for all of that, Michael, and I, I couldn't agree more. I think that in the beginning of the lockdown, you know, these Hollywood Square um, click track layering, layering versions of, of masterpieces, it was, it was a lifeline for folks. But I, I think that um, for all the reasons you point out, we, we also have to acknowledge the limitation of that. And, um, and I think we need to move beyond. It's, it can be a useful educational tool. It can be initiatory, but I don't think there's anything transformative about it. And, and there's a lot that is actually quite anti-musical about it. Um, so, you know, I, I have shifted my focus and, and redirected just all the resources that I have, both within the university and also just personally, to commissioning a bunch of music, producing the most creative minds that I know, to deal creatively within the limitations that we have looking at you know the the chamber that is this this bizarre virtual space as an instrument as a new instrument that we need to collectively learn how to play and to play sensitively and responsibly um and to use creatively so that that for me as an educational tool and also as you know as an artist just as another way of uh of trying to approximate what what we had before but to Marin's point, also not fall down the trap of, of approximating and backing into something, but really embracing a new way of making work and a new way of collaborating. I think, I think we all need to put energy into, into those types of setups um, so that we're not just replicating and, and, and repeating. 
Um, and also so that we're not just waiting for the world to change because we just don't know how long it's, it's, that we're gonna be locked down this way. And we have a lot of music that needs to be made and a lot of learning that needs to take place. And what do you think, um, Claire, about, and, and Michael and everyone, Jerry, about, <clears throat> about the idea though of, of trying to imagine um, another, another iteration, another art form coming out of this so that perhaps if we collaborate with art directors on how we can creatively, you know, not just, okay, this is how we did it. Okay, so this is how we're gonna do it. But maybe there are new, are new ways to envision using the Zoom technology, the technology that we have available to us at the mo in the moment while pushing um, the, the real techies to move toward figuring out the latency issues as much as they possibly can. I don't know if that's even within the realm of possibility. Oh, I think it's absolutely within the realm of possibility. And I think that the, the, the best people to push that forward are our students. Um, I, I, I like to ask myself the question, you know, what worlds are possible because they're already here? You know, I think those of us who are in positions of, of authority and power culturally at academic institutions, whatever, you know, we, we think we're entrusted with creating all the ideas. Well, actually, the, the ideas, the great ideas are going to come from, from the folks who are actually already doing this work. Um, and, and, you know, w what you point out, Marin, is that's, that's the precise reason why I decided to teach an interdisciplinary course this fall so that we can not just create new art forms, but we can create an environment in which scientists, botanists, filmmakers, visual artists, social justice activists, and musicians can come together and decide what their art form of this particular moment is going to be. Um, and so I think of you know, I think of my responsibility as an educator is actually creating those environments, resourcing them, supporting them, and doing my very best to get out of the way. I, if I can say, I, I totally agree. And I think that um, I, we've thought about this. I've continued to meet with my students during the summer, even though school isn't officially going on. But uh, one of them last year did a project. There was a beautiful project with a uh, student composer, dancers, staging, senior, and, and a small chamber group, which could all actually take place via Zoom or some sort of technology like this. And I think, you know, Claire's point is that our students are going to be the one that are going to be able to think outside the box, uh, outside our traditional boxes and outside of our traditional silos, and that's just going to move us ahead. And so uh, coming out of all of this, we'll return to something like what we had before, but it's not going to be exactly the same. There are going to be all sorts of issues. Who, entrance, exit out of concert halls, who gives you the program? Will there be actually printed programs anymore? Will there be, you know, there's going to be a lot of things like that that we'll have to deal with. And so I think that it's the people who are really familiar with the technology, which is from our seventh year old granddaughter who's more familiar with the technology than I am, but going all the way up through our students right now who are finding right now, I have a couple of colleagues, Tiffany Galis and Luke Gall, who are starting another venture called uh, Keep Making Music. And it's dealing with ways to sort of improve upon the Hollywood Square sort of uh, production. So I think all of these things are gonna be additions to the recipe that uh, before COVID-19, we wouldn't have thought about. I never heard of Zoom four months ago, and now my life is controlled by it. <laughs> If, if I could just say, just, just briefly, um, the, uh, I sort of have two sides of myself, right? There's, there's the, the cellist artist side um, that is so super excited about everything that, that we're talking about and the possibilities, the new creative possibilities. Then there's my director of chamber music side that says we also um, need to, uh, it's my responsibility to keep teaching um, and and supporting the playing of, of old music because that's part of part of what we do and it's very important. And by old music, I don't just mean Beethoven and Schubert. I mean Bartok and Messiaen and Ligeti. You know, at this point, like, like old music. Um, uh, so so be, and and I say this because I think there are probably a lot of people out there who are in my position where where yes, there are the creative possibilities, but we have to think really creatively about. <laughs> doing what we did, which is, which is extremely important for our students, there's no doubt. There's the part about doing what we did, and there's the part about how we turn, how we turn pedagogy on its ear and what we are asking them to do as we move forward. Mm -hmm. There are a number of questions that are coming in on the Q&A 
about what kinds of skill sets should a student be able to do when she leaves school or what kinds of skill sets should we be teaching our students uh, so that they can be successful in this new world paradigm. So I'll ask any of you to chime in on that. What are the things that you'll be incorporating for students um, or it, it, whether it's, it's software platforms or other kinds of um, recording technology or, or what have you? Silence. <laughs> I, I can jump in. Um, very, very curious to, to hear what everybody else has to say about this. You know, before I answer in, in practical terms and in terms of software that I would recommend and, and platforms and even curriculum, I, I really want to bring this back to basics. You know, what I want my students to get out of this semester specifically is the ability to build a community against all odds, to define for themselves what their musical community is, who it includes, to be critical about who it excludes and why, to do deep thinking with themselves in this space of loneliness that we've all been forced into and also in community with their, with their colleagues in the classroom. And this is also another reason why all the curriculum I'm developing this fall puts students outside of the classroom, outside of the university with every exercise. They have to go talk to people who are different than they are, who look at the world differently, who are gonna challenge their deeply held beliefs and assumptions. So the, the ability to build a, a meaningful musical community let's say in December, or to at least have, have built some muscle and some empathy and, and some, some human tools to be able to do that, I think is the single, that's my single biggest priority as an educator. And I also think that, you know, reciprocity and generosity and um, the ability to sit with uncertainty, these are things that for, for humans right now are so incredibly important for musicians I don't think there's ever been a time when we needed to lean into those things and cultivate those things in ourselves and in one another as collaborators as much as the world is asking us to cultivate those things. So I'm trying to think about those things before I dial in methods, software, um, specific repertoire assignments, or even you know deciding which artists and which collaborations, which commissions are gonna ground the, the plan. And I'm trying to keep myself really humble and really honest about those essential values. Can I just say that um, I think, in a, in a way, as a, as a teacher, I, I'm obviously like all of us, I'm concerned about our students. And so it's maybe the method changes, but it, in a way the goal doesn't change uh, because what, you're, what we're trying to do is save them some time, first of all, but also help them to be curious, um, help them to think and help them to explore. Uh, and there's more to explore now. And I, it's such an interesting time. All of the, the not only COVID-19 and what's happened because we've had a forced sabbatical in a way so that we've been able to think about things that, at least that I haven't necessarily had the time to dwell on uh, for the last few years, but that we're coinciding with Me Too, with Black Lives Matter. John Lewis just passed away, you know, and so the, his quote of, you know, making good trouble, all of these things are intersecting. And so how, how can we help our students to capitalize on this moment for society and for themselves? So I think it's, it's actually, we can come out of this better than we ever were. And we have to help them be able to lead us for that. There are a number of questions that I've seen come in around uh, pre-conservatory education. Um, not only children, middle school, high school, uh, age students and how we inspire and motivate them during this time and what kinds of work we should be doing with them right now. So I will turn to any of you who, who would like to chime in on that. Well, I think that, um, you know, in, in many ways, um, it, it's the younger kids that I think are, are struggling the most or whether they're conscious of it or not. Um, that are going to be impacted, perhaps I should say. And um, I think whatever we can do also to inspire our older students, our higher education students to engage in that education process for the young, younger ones. Um, you know, I, I'm fortunate to, to have an incredible executive director at the ORCIDS program um, at the Baltimore Symphony who immediately saw that um, the kids at the, in the Baltimore public schools were not going to be getting the kind of education that they need. And immediately 
and pivoted to go online with all the lessons and, you know, and, and tr create a new kind of paradigm. And so, you know, I'm trying to um, interest my students or at least inspire them to create content for these kids, to, to try to become involved as mentors. You know, this is something that I think we've lost track of as well when, as Claire was speaking about the values that we need to, we need to reassess and recommit to our values. What are our priorities? But I think mentoring is a huge one that we, we really should work with our students to, to promote and, and get that as part of the core of being an artist, that we're artists to serve society. We're not artists to serve ourselves. And, you know, let's, let's really change the tone, as Beethoven said. You know, you think of Beethoven, <laughs> this was his 250th anniversary. Let's use him for something, huh? Um, and, and, and let's, also, I just want to say that I believe that it's an opportunity to equalize access. And why don't we take this opportunity to equalize access for everybody? That's one of the things that I have a huge problem with. Is, is the inaccessibility of what we do to the majority of, of the public. And how could we use this time to change that? Well, if I could uh, piggyback on that and, and also address the previous question, because I think they're related. Um, you know, what, what skills we want our students to have now? Well, um, it's not just what skills, but what values and um, I think one thing that this crisis has laid bare, um, something we maybe many of us and especially the, the students have taken for granted, which is how important a human need it is to have a collective experience of music um, that's live. I think, um, I think someday when we come out of this, lot, you know, concerts are going to be valued more than ever because people are missing them so much and they're realizing that the computer is no substitute really for the for the real thing and the power of music and that we can rethink which we've all been talking about now for years rethink what a concert is and that playing for 12 people on a street corner in baltimore which i've done recently is the most meaningful concert imaginable. And, um, and I'm involved with an organization that's paying musicians well to do this. So on both sides of the equation, it's what we've been after, which is to bring, make music more accessible for people who simply don't have access to it. Um, and to allow musicians to actually make a living doing that and to give both sides the most meaningful um, musical experience. I mean, for the musicians as well. Um, I, if, if, if this is a skill or a value that comes out of this for our students, I think we will have really gained something um, uh, just so important and beautiful. I just mentioned that, you know, I'm the product of my father was a high school band director. And so even though I don't teach in the public schools, I, I work a lot in the public schools with people and I, they have my undying gratitude and respect because they are having to deal with this in a way that affects them profoundly. And, and I've been really inspired over the last 48 hours because there's a, there's a summer convention, the Texas Bandmasters Convention, which is going on right now in San Antonio, which isn't happening, of course, and it's all online. And it has been so inspiring to see those sessions and see how the paradigm is shifting in their thinking. I mean, so, so how can we go on? How can we make the best of this? What sort of remote teaching can we do? The, the ideas that have been discussed, uh, and it's all, uh, it's, I believe they're saving all of those sessions online. So for public school teachers, I would invite you to go uh, check that out. But uh, People are, it's not business as usual. And I think everyone realizes that right now. So those are, that's the level where uh, the most work is having to be done, I think. And, you know, just picking up um, a thread from, from what Marin mentioned earlier, you know, I, I think that 
the one-on-one -on -one mentorship is perhaps the best use of the Zoom platform. I've had some incredibly meaningful, not just lessons, but conversations, breakthrough conversations with students. And I've encouraged them to pay it forward also by each taking on at least one mentee, someone young, someone in their community, someone who can't afford lessons, someone who needs a mentor who's maybe just a few years older than they are. Um, because that, that culture of mentorship is, look, we, none of us would be here, none of us would be musicians or music educators if somebody at some point, generally it's a public school teacher, hadn't taken us under their wing and said, I'm going to give of you, <laughs> I'm going to give my, my time um, to you, I'm going to give to you very, very generously. So encouraging students in this moment specifically to seek out those opportunities and, and to learn how to teach too. And I would add to that also to, to, um, to teach us how to teach. <laughs> because this, this needs to happen in, in a, in a multi-directional and intergenerational way. Because I, I sincerely hope that we come out of this profoundly changed. I think if we don't come out of this changed and changed for the better, um, I, I, think, I think it'll be a crying shame. <laughs> and if our music, if our, if our literature and our way of supporting one another, the, the equity and accessibility and inclusivity of our institutions, if all of that isn't radically redefined, then the joke's on us. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, Claire, how, how, are you, how are you seeing the leadership of the, the major um, musical institutions? Um, uh, how, are you, how are you interpreting either their actions or their inaction at the moment? How can we, how can we um, urge them forward it, rather than I, I feel like I feel like so many institutions are in this sort of holding pattern waiting for things to return to what they were instead of jumping into a proactive um, role of how we can certainly just the issues that have come up and have been with us hello for forever the issues of diversity and equity you know, they're not issues that you can just slap band-aids on. These are issues that go to the core of how we need to start rethinking our roles in the world and, and what kind of, you know, but I, I guess maybe for me, my disappointment at the moment is that I don't see that willingness to jump forward. I, I see band-aids coming up mm -hmm. instead of, you know, really let's, let's gather together, but maybe, maybe we can try to, try to inspire them or push them. Well, I would love to have that conversation with you and with anybody on this call who's interested in having it, because to be frank and to answer your question, I've been extremely disappointed and, and distressed at the response of the cultural gatekeepers, the folks with the, with the most power, with the largest endowments, with the most resources. At the same time, I think it's important to hold the complexity of this moment. I have been not just impressed and inspired, but bowled over by the artist to artist response, by what small organizations, by what you know, tiny contemporary opera companies and contemporary music ensembles and social justice organizations have been doing. Intersectionally, I, I mean, it's, it's not as if we don't have an abundance of ideas. Um, but what the large institutions need to be doing is resourcing those small organizations, resourcing individual artists. And in a place like New York, it just astonishes me that the large cultural institutions have not taken this moment to say, well, here, you know, we don't know what's going on, but there's one thing we can do. And we've never done it before. Invest in artists who live and work and are stuck in New York. They're some of the most brilliant people anywhere in the world. And, you know, if anybody has lived in New York before, you know that making it big in New York means you get the privilege of paying rent here and collecting mail. But your work is, is elsewhere, it's in Europe, it's in Asia, it's Australia. And then if you have a really successful project, it's bought back by one of the major houses here. This is a moment to completely shift that paradigm, invest in, you know, not just, I would say importantly, not to invest in the established artists, invest in the emerging artists, create emerging artist programs, give fellowships to the people who are making this work and, and ideating and creating solutions. They're not hypothesizing about it, they're actually demonstrating solutions. And while organizations are sitting around wondering if they're going to open their doors and in what capacity, they should be spending money doing this. And, and, and they, they would be better for it. But more importantly, our, our culture and, um, and, and everything about our, our ecology would be improved as a result. But I'd love to have that conversation with you and, and talk about ways that we can. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm already writing you an email on, on 
Marin's multitasking. <laughs> or, or in my mind, I'm multitasking. Fantastic. I'd love to continue that conversation with both of you, actually, because I think that's, I mean, it's been very impactful work at Peabody over the last many years. And it's something that I, I personally and many of us at Peabody have been deeply committed to. And so thank you for really diving in deep on that, on that topic here. I am shocked to see that it is 11.51 or 12.51 p.m. Eastern time, and we only have about nine minutes left of this session. I'd like to ask each of you um, if you were to give the 679 participants right now on this webinar one or two bits of advice, either things that you've um, experience that you uh, that went really well for you over the last four months or bits of things that you hope for for the future uh, what would those little pieces of inspiration or um, counsel be and I'll, I'll start in the same order that we went last time starting with or at the beginning with Michael Cannon please I would say to everyone um, you know just be really true to your yourself and to your artistic values and to your to your values as teachers um, and and you know I think if you if you bury in and and really get to the heart of, of what it is that you do and why you do it and why it's meaningful to you you, you can hardly go wrong and those are the things that we want to um, pass on to our students anyway and you know the the, the, the vehicle or the media, the medium um, is less important that, that we all really do what, what, you know, teach from who we are and what we believe. Thank you, Michael. Jerry? Yeah, I, first of all, thanks so much again for putting this together. It's been great to learn from my colleagues here. But uh, I, I would, I, I don't know that I have advice to give except to just stay connected. This is, Michael mentioned this or several people have. It's been so gratifying to me that I have reconnected with people via Zoom uh, that we see each other maybe once a year or something like that and we'll talk on the phone on occasion, but we've set up Zoom cocktail hours, uh, you know, and we've been meeting on a regular basis, composers, conductors, musicians, friends. Um, and so in a way, this has brought us together in a different sort of way. And then also with my students, uh, the same thing. It's given, this has given me the opportunity to think um, and discover some things. That I mentioned that stack of scores earlier that I had for my upcoming concerts. I, I'm actually not interested in any of those pieces anymore because I found a lot of things to look forward to now that are different that I just had that people have brought to my attention uh, that I've been able to delve into so which I'm now very excited about. Um, so in a way I hate to say it but um, this hasn't been all bad. So I've, you know, I'm coming out of this disappointed that maybe I've missed some music making opportunities and some collaborations, but this is going to open up different things, I think, for all of us. And that's exciting rather than depressing, at least in my thinking. Claire? Yeah, thank you both for that. And thank you all for, for being here today with us. You know, I don't know that I have any advice. I feel it's, it's a presumptuous time to, to give advice, but I can certainly share with you the conversations that I have with myself and the kinds of advice I try to give myself. And it would fall into two, two little categories. One is that, you know, this is a moment to really deepen the way that we listen. You know, listening unconditionally is something that as musicians, when we're in the midst of a chamber music experience, we actually do better. We do not just more virtuosically, like we do it more generously and more sensitively, I think, than any other group of people. Like those abilities are so attuned. And I, I think that um, those abilities are also threatened right now because we're not in the room with other physical bodies um, doing, doing this thing that's so essential to, to us and to our art form. But I think in any way that we can encourage ourselves and especially our students to listen unconditionally to their environments, to the world around them, to the suffering of this world, all of that will end up in our music making. It'll end up in our teaching. And I, I think that is, that's like one of the great callings of this moment. That's something I'm, I'm working on. Um, you know, the other thing I would say is I, I, I find myself, as I imagine a lot of, a lot of people and educators here do, torn between, between, um, 
wanting the best for music and wanting the best for a person or a group of people in a situation. And that's always a tension, right? That's always a tension in, in teaching. It's always a tension in, in playing and in practicing. And I think this is a moment to, above all, prioritize taking care of people and to trust that music is going to be fine. We're going to have to do it in different ways. It's, it's going to be so different when we emerge out of this. But when, when we're faced with that choice, we have to take care of people. And that also means scrapping whatever curriculum you might have had for that day and talking about whatever is on the student's mind. It can take all kinds of forms. Um, but I think that's a good rule of thumb for our moment and certainly for what we're going into this fall. I love that emphasis, Claire, on flexibility right now and taking care of each other because I think that there's very little else that we, um, that is more important than that at this time. I think you're absolutely right. Uh, Marin. Yeah, well, I, I, I couldn't agree more. The, you know, in thinking about it, um, I would say that something that's always distressed me um, in our field is this idea of measuring things. You know, and, and particularly being, I, I feel like um, it's, it's part of an American um, obsession measuring, you know, how many gigs you have, how much, the, but the, all these kinds of things. I think this is a moment again to, to let go of that, that thought. Also, um, there's, a, there's a term that's used, you know, the pursuit of artistic excellence, which I find has become a little bit of a, um, an escape and, and, and a, something that people like to hide behind while we're pursuing artistic excellence. What does that mean anymore? I mean, of course, we wouldn't go into it if we weren't pursuing artistic excellence. But why don't we let go of all of these, these things now and talk about why we make music? We make music to connect on a fundamental human level. And I believe that now is the moment when we need to dig deep into who we are as human beings and how we can try to help each other out. Because we've lost sight of this on, on so many levels, you know, going for this pursuit of perfection. I mean, perfection is so overrated. I, I can't even, you know, what is perfection and, and why are we going there? Um, let's start to talk about how we can move people, how we can connect with each other. And maybe it starts with our students and I think back to what Michael started with, having a conversation about how they're feeling, how they're doing. You know, these, these are the moments where we can really help each other. And I'm not saying that I can help you more than you can help me. I feel that I'm, it's a, we're all equal now. We all need each other's help. So let's go back to the human, the human issues. That, that's what I would say. Marin Alsop, Claire Chase, Jerry Junkin, and Michael Cannon, I knew when I reached out to all of you that we were in for a fantastically wonderful uh, conversation. And you have not disappointed today. You have been inspirational and insightful and so thoughtful in your comments and in how not only you, um, some of the tips about how you plan to address the coming year, but also really what's on your mind. Thank you from, from the bottom of my heart. And I see lots of thanks coming in on the chat as well from, from, from the folks uh, um, participating today. I also want to thank Christina Mansior, Zane Forshee, Patrick Wallen, and Adam Scalici for their support behind the scenes.